नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू सनसेट टेलीविजन आई एम विशाल दहिया एंड यू आर वॉचिंग आर शो परस्पेक्टिव वेर वी ब्रिंग यू डिटेल्ड एनालिसिस ऑफ की नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल इश्यूज टुडे वी गोन टॉक अबाउट इंडियाज विजन ऑफ इंडो पैसेफिक नाउ द इंडो पैसेफिक रीजन इज अ वास्ट मेरी टाइम जोन वेयर द इंटरेस्ट ऑफ मेनी प्लेयर्स आर एंगेज इंडियाज एंगेजमेंट विद द इंडो पैसेफिक गोज बैक सेवल सेंचुरीज इंडिया हैज बिन चैंपियनिंग द फ्री एंड ओपन इंडो पैसेफिक आइडिया एंड इनिशियटिंग फॉरम्स लाइक सिक्योरिटी एंड ग्रोथ फॉर ऑल इन द रीजन दैट इज सागर एंड द इंडो पैसेफिक ओशंस इनिशियटिव आई पी ओ आई इंडिया एंगेज विद इट्स इंडो पैसेफिक पार्टनर्स आई द बायोलेट्रिक or on uh, pluralateral and multilateral platforms as well in a multitude of spheres including maritime security blue economy maritime connectivity disaster management and capacity building as well the importance of indo pacific region to global gdp and maritime trade reflects a shift in the world economic center of gravity to the indo pacific now in today's episode we will discuss and analyze uh, india's vision of indo pacific and all related aspects as well and for more on this we joined by a distinguished panel of experts let me first introduce them to you beginning with we have with, with us in the studio dad major general dhruv sri katocha is here with us a director of india foundation welcome general katocha Thank to you. the sunset tv we also are joined by miss uh, stefania menalia she is uh, associate researcher with cps and uh, Professor Harshvi Pant is also joining us. He is the head of the Strategic Studies Program at ORF. Welcome, both of you, as well to Sunset TV. I'll begin with you, uh, Professor Pant. Uh, since a lot has been uh, talked about this this particular construct, and a lot has been discussed and said in the rise in a dialogue as well, let's start by understanding the the concept of Indo-Pacific first. Uh, uh, the the vastness, not only in terms of uh, geographical terms, but also the strategic terms, geostrategic terms. Uh, thank you, Vishal. You know, uh, Vish Vishal, what has happened in the last uh, few years, I would say, is is uh, is a rebalancing of our uh, uh, mental mapping of the world. We have started looking at the world through different lenses, through different and 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 so new strategic geographies have started emerging. And Indo-Pacific, this idea has you know, uh, our uh, uh, many of our intellectuals uh, in the past have talked about it. not in similar terms but articulating that uh, the 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 engagement that india has had with both its peripheries towards the western uh, you know in, uh, uh, sea sea routes as well as the eastern ones uh, historically culturally india has been tied uh, to its neighbors in that vast maritime space mm -hmm. but it's only in recent times that it it has acquired a strategic connotation and that you know that this this aspect that indian ocean and pacific ocean no, uh, no longer can be seen as distinct water bodies distinct strategic spaces uh, with their own uh, power balances with their own institutional frameworks with their own normative architectures i think what what has happened today is as the center of gravity of global politics global economics and the rise of new powers like china and india have transformed this part of the world it has become imperative for global, for the international community to look at this vast maritime space as one contiguous maritime zone okay. and that is where indian ocean and pacific ocean come together in the words of uh, uh, former uh, japanese prime minister the confluence of the two seas that famous speech he gave uh, in the indian parliament articulating this idea uh, that as powers like china rise they are transforming the periphery and india's role has been growing commensurately so how do you bring it all together within one frame of reference mm -hmm. and indo pacific as a construct started emerging out of that and india's vision as you had mentioned was articulated by prime minister modi in shangrila where it was it is about uh, you know a uh, free open inclusive and rules based order has to be protected has to be ensured in this part of the world to make sure that it is not simply about major powers that it okay. is about every single country in the region every single nation that has a stake in that freedom in that openness in that inclusivity that has to be brought on board and i think that fuels india's vision that it is not a small clique of countries as some other you know as china for example has criticized this is about engaging at the broadest possible level at the broadest at, at, at its broadest inclusivity uh, bringing countries small and large with at times also different visions many okay. of the countries that are like minded also have different articulations of the indo pacific Indeed. but that but on principles they agree that as so long as we we are committed to a to this idea of free open inclusive uh, indo pacific that follows a rules based order we are in this together for, for for the prosperity of the region for the security of the region and the, for the long term strategic orientation of the region okay. so i think india has articulated that vision and india has put forth a lot of resources and a lot a lot of diplomatic commitment of course it's not perfect but i think what is happening as the 
the global community is evolving. India's vision uh, is becoming important in articulating that. And in platforms like the Raisina Dialogue, for example, there has been a lot of discussion about mm -hmm. uh, what Indo-Pacific means uh, for India, what Indo-Pacific means for the world, and how the international community can come together to preserve stability and security and economic prosperity in this very vital uh, part of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the global order, okay. where uh, you know, e economics and geopolitics are increasingly converging. Okay. So I think that vision has been propagated, that vision has been articulated, and other countries, like-minded countries, have joined it. Indeed, indeed. And then we'll, we'll dwell uh, deeper into that uh, vision as well, uh, which uh, we're focusing on here, as Professor Pant is pointing out. Uh, clearly, it's about a uh, free and open Indo-Pacific and uh, with a focus on ensuring that all stakeholders are brought on the board as well. Uh, but let's also understand the wider worldview here. Uh, you know, Stefania, we would like to understand uh, how does uh, the other stakeholders here, other, uh, you know, big powers uh, apart from India, because... Uh, uh, we will have to understand that it's not just India which has an interest and a stake in Indo-Pacific. It's, it's other, uh, you know, greater powers in the, in, the, in the world as well. And, of course, uh, uh, smaller countries uh, in, in the region also. Uh, well, you can certainly say that the vision that India, the, the values and the principles expressed by India are shared by others, notably the European Union. Now, you may know that the European Union, after a long time, actually issued its own Indo-Pacific strategy uh, last September 2021. Uh, this is actually first taking inspiration from the French uh, and then the Dutch and a little bit the guidelines of the Germans. These are the countries that articulated their own Indo-Pacific strategy. And then from this uh, arrives the Indo European Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, in this Indo European Indo-Pacific strategy, the values and the principles that Professor Pant just described are very much in line with what is included in the European concept. So the concept of inclusivity, uh, trying to involve uh, and engage partners of all sorts, um, really trying to, climate, to create this, clim this kind of climate. And we have seen this also taking inspiration from uh, Resina these days. These principles have been repeated these days. And this is really what, uh, what differentiates, if you want, um, approaches like the one of India and the European Union mm -hmm. uh, from a much more... Um, and in a way, also, the Japanese uh, approach is very similar to this uh, from perhaps maybe a United States approach, which is a little bit more um, confrontational in the language, uh, where you, you put the word which is a little bit more, um, of course, oriented into the um, American and Chinese context. So uh, I would read these uh, macro Indo-Pacific strategies in this way. Okay. Okay, okay. Clearly, you know, there are uh, various interests there. But, uh, uh, General Katoch, you know, if we have to understand uh, at, at a much deeper level, and, and India has been talking about very clearly that uh, it has to be uh, free and open, that's one. And two, uh, there has to be a rule-based order. Now, these two are basic principles. Then, of course, is the principle of inclusivity. And uh, we are looking at it not only from the economic point of view, from the cultural point of view, from the maritime point of view, but also from a strategic point of view. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Vishal, you know, uh, I think the, the point about the rules-based order is something which I think has been expressed across the board, except for one or two countries. Uh, uh, one, of the, one, of the person, one of the countries which really hasn't talked about a rules-based order is China. Because uh, ultimately, when we are looking at the Indo-Pacific construct, um, while no one is directly saying that it is, um, uh, when we talk of the rule-based order, we are referring to China. But I think there is, all, there is that underlying suggestion that China also needs to follow the rules which have been laid out, uh, especially because it is a signatory to UNCLOS. Mm -hmm. uh, India is also a signatory. Uh, so we have to follow a certain set of rules. Now, those sets of rules are not really being followed by China because uh, in the Chinese, uh, the way China is looking at the uh, South China Sea specifically, they are looking at the South China Sea as a gateway to one, spread to the Indian Ocean, and number two, to spread to the Pacific. Otherwise, if they can't do that, they are confined to this, uh, to the SCS itself. Mm -hmm. Now, this, I think, is China's concern as to how to break out. And uh, towards that end, it has built those artificial islands, it has laid claims um, uh, and it is not accepting the claims which other countries have made. So even when Philippines won the case in the uh, international court, 
uh, the Chinese didn't accept it. Okay. So this is this aspect of the inter the rules based order. I think is something which is very important, and this was emphasized time and again by Prime Minister uh, Modi also. But it is it is actually it is much more than that. You know the way world trade, as you mentioned in your opening remarks. You know the entire world trade. More than 50% of the world trade now has shifted to the Indo-Pacific, mm. whereas earlier it was. I think this shift took place, I think, a year or two, a year or two back. Whereas otherwise, the uh, the uh, economic center of gravity was actually in the Atlantic. Now that shift is taking place, and every year it will keep increasing. So when we are looking at this gigantic shift in the economy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously it has got certain different implications, and where the economy goes, uh, the strategic interests also follow. So this is going to be this is going to be an area which is going to be contested, and because it is going to be contested, it is important to have those rules. And uh, if you don't have a rules-based order, then I think there will be some element of anarchy, and it will be uh, the rule by the strong. And uh, this is something which I think India would like to prevent. Okay. So one of the reasons of the Quad also coming in, uh, when you look at the larger motive of the Quad coming in is really to ensure a rules-based order mm -hmm. and free and open navigation. Okay. Uh, the China, of course, has got its BRI. It is also looking to the maritime BRI. India starting off the Sagarmala, the, the, the ports connectivity projects. And uh, I think what we are also looking at now, what India should be looking at now is getting along with the European Union, with the United States, Australia and Japan, also on these connectivity routes. Okay. As to how can we strengthen the connectivity routes as an alternate to what China is doing. Okay, now that's, that's, that's a very interesting point there. Connectivity routes part one there, Professor Pant. I'd like to bring you in here. That, that's, that's one part aspect. And second, as uh, you know, both uh, Stephanie also referred to it and uh, you know, General Katoz is also uh, elaborating on it uh, in, in, in a detailed way, is, is the focus on ensuring that the rule-based order is maintained in Indo-Pacific and that has to be, uh, you know, everybody's responsibility, all the stakeholders. Uh, yes, indeed, you know, uh, there are two things here. One is, of course, uh, that when you are trying to frame uh, a policy response to a major power shift in the region, then you have to be able to provide uh, uh, you know, a credible alternative. And I think a large part of the problem for the last uh, few years has been that we have all been complaining a lot, but doing very little about it. So, you know, China has provided serious alternatives on many questions to smaller countries in the region, to our, even to India's neighbors, for example. Now, uh, you, you know, we, we can uh, talk about or we can uh, uh, challenge uh, whether this is a long-term sustainable proposition for some of the smaller, weaker poorer countries, uh, resources are important, connectivity is important, and aid is important. And I think China almost monopolized that for a very long time. So what is now happening is that, uh, you know, uh, Stefania mentioned uh, European Union, then you have America, then you have India's partners, close partners like Japan or Australia. All of them are trying to come together and provide real alternatives to these smaller states, to these um, uh, you know, to, to the regional states, so that uh, there can be a credible alternative to what China is offering. Otherwise, uh, you know, China is the only game in town, and and you are all you know almost always reacting to what China is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, on on a, on a range of issues, as the power has shifted, as the geoeconomic and geopolitical power has shifted to to to, to Indo Pacific, China's role had become very prominent, and China was offering a kind of a vision. Uh, you know, some of us may not like it, but some of the, some of the countries were willing to buy. So I think the way to frame it, and and and, and as you mentioned, uh, for a, for a number of countries in the region, the way to frame it is not to say that look, this is about this is this is only about China. This is about uh, positioning or pivoting <coughs> against China. This is also, and I think our, our foreign minister said that that this is also for something. This is not anti-China only. This is also for something. Uh, for for stability in the region, for for equity in the region, for access to uh, resources in the region. So I think there is also this desire to offer a positive agenda in the region, okay. which I think a lot of like-minded countries are willing to offer, and therefore also are saying that look, if we have to ensure a rules-based order, then we have to put our resources uh, where they are most needed. We have to bring to bear our strategic heft where it's most needed, and we have to come together and figure out a solution to regional problems, because that's the only way uh, to counter a different narrative that, that has been emerging. Okay. So I think that is what rules-based order has, has become at the moment. Okay, okay. Stefania, on, on the rule-based order concept, you know, and the aspect there, it becomes, as I was saying earlier, it becomes really important for all the stakeholders. It's not just about India. 
uh, you know, the buck can't just stop uh, with India just because it's in the neighborhood. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, uh, the, uh, the other stakeholders, the, the other countries, uh, you know, a bigger powers there to uh, uh, take on, uh, pick it on and ensure that it is maintained. Yes, yeah, so if you, I actually also wanted to comment on the connectivity issue, which I think is, is crucial. And if Please. I get your question right, you are asking regarding the responsibility and how to enforce the responsibility of securing the rule of order. Um, so on the connectivity, um, the European Union, as you may know already, they, um, uh, just recently launched the Global Gateway, which is a major connectivity policy, which simply streamlines what is already existing, notably with India, EU-India Connectivity Partnership, uh, another milestone of the bilateral cooperation. But all of this is actually organically feeding into the what the, the strategy I was mentioning before of the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. All of this to say that there is indeed this uh, profound reflection on how to actually be an actor uh, in the region. And this is actually all the elements that they've given until now are broadly speaking, regarding the whole economic dimension, broadly, yeah, of course, because this is, you know, falling into uh, what we can say economic issues or non-traditional security issues. When it comes to the more traditional security issue, there is another important reflection that has been going on and it was just published uh, inside the EU, which is the strategic compass. Okay. And the strategic compass is exactly um, what the EU defines as a threat, is the first uh, of such um, document for the EU, is really um, a stepping stone important for the EU to understand how it will eventually become a security actor. Okay. Uh, of course, which kind of security actor? So here we go into the question of, you know, um, how we are going to work towards ensuring that uh, rule of law is actually respected. So we will. All of this is uh, eventually going to be integrated into, a, you know, into a consolidated reflection. Okay. And this is how the EU is actually growing into becoming an active actor, especially in the Indo-Pacific, which really has an emphasis. And of course, India in this context is, is okay. the prime interlocutor. Okay. Okay. Indeed, uh, that's uh, very, uh, you know, uh, finding a uh, way of looking at it, uh, General Kadosh, that. Uh, it's, it's obviously going to be interconnected, you know, it's, it's all inti integrated. Uh, of course, all the stakeholders will have to find a way to ensure that rule of law is maintained. But apart from that, if, if we have to understand, uh, you know, uh, what are the key challenges there when we're talking about Indo-Pacific? Because as you're also referring to it, uh, that the center of gravity of economic activities is uh, shifting very, uh, you know, fast towards Indo-Pacific and thus, the strategic, uh, you know, alliances uh, and the strategic importance as well. I think uh, the way I look at it is, you know, uh, on two issues. One is there has to be a maritime trade routes when we are looking at the Indo-Pacific. So here, when we are looking at the maritime trade routes, we are looking at ports along various countries. And if we are going to have this maritime trade routes, which are going to be functional um, for long periods of time, uh, then, of course, there has to be a security element. That means we have to ensure that those trade routes are secure. Mm -hmm. Because without that, then the system will, uh, will, will again collapse. Now, the smaller countries do not have the capacity, actually, to carry out, uh, to look into various security aspects. So that is where I think the, 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 uh, the, the, the bigger countries, they will have to be what we call the uh, security providers in the region. Mm -hmm. Now, India can take on the role of being a security provider. The Prime Minister has made that statement quite a few times. Uh, but it cannot be just left to India. So Japan will have to take the role. Australia will have to take the role. And uh, uh, the United States will also have to bear a major portion of this particular uh, 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 of looking into the security aspect. Okay. And now the interesting thing which is happening is, you see, we are finding European countries individually had started coming in, like that France and Germany and Britain had expressed great interest. But now we are looking at the European Union as a combined whole, looking very seriously into the Indo-Pacific. And I think that is the great shift which has taken place in the, uh, at least that is what I observed in the Raisina Dialogue, uh, which has just concluded now. Mm -hmm. So we, when we are looking at uh, cooperative structures, perhaps it won't, you know, individually, of course, there will be bilateral uh, engagements. But when we are looking at India per se, we, want, we are also part of BIMSTEC. So how will BIMSTEC engage with ASEAN? You know, how will BIMSTEC and ASEAN both together engage with the Quad or engage with other uh, Indo-Pacific countries? Okay. No, I think we are going to we are going to see a, 
a whole range of uh, uh, a whole range of actors and uh, institutions actually coming into play now because this region day by day is becoming more and more vital and if the security interests here are threatened it will be uh, it will be disastrous as far as the economy of most of the world uh, most of the world's economies are concerned indeed and that is something which i don't think any of us can afford as of now indeed uh, no one can and it becomes really important uh, these these maritime trade routes and uh, the center of economic activity does become really important there professor pant you know uh, before we bring this discussion to an end uh, uh, your views on uh, on the way forward from here keeping in mind all these concepts uh, Uh, of of ensuring that this region not only follows the rule based order but all stakeholders have equal say and get the equal benefit as well yes i think uh, you know uh, a lot of it will have to do with uh, with greater coordination amongst um, uh, you know different actors we have we have seen articulations and that's a very very positive sign uh, you know we have seen uh, robust articulations from from major countries from major powers including european union Uh, which for a very long time was was you know uh, was not in, uh, willing to be in, in, take a geopolitical position now it is openly articulating a very robust position on these matters uh, but increasingly as we move forward how can how can these like minded uh, countries coordinate their actions certainly uh, you know coordination of resources coordination of strategic priorities all that would matter if you are looking at a long term vision of what kind of a security architecture what kind of a strategic architecture you want Uh, to, uh, to uh, you want to emerge in 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 the Indo-Pacific, and I think all the you know one thing that we also have to realize is that this is a vast maritime space, vast geography, which is relatively new strategic geography. Therefore, uh, institutional frameworks are still missing. We have institutions that that cater to older ones. So uh, you know uh, whether ASEAN will be able to uphold its centrality, uh, whether uh, you know whether in in Southeast Asia, South Asia. as general katojo was mentioning bimstec can engage more productively with uh, with asean whether you have the older uh, position of, of platforms like east asia summit uh, continuing to attain their relevance because now you see this we are in this phase of issue based coalitions loose coalitions ad hoc coalitions which which uh, give greater flexibility like quad for example is generating a lot of debate but quad plus is also generating a lot of debate during rising <laughs> one of the sessions uh, south koreans Uh, have said that they would be very interested in joining the quad mm -hmm. now the question is how do you then go from uh, a space where there are where there's a lack of institution to create that institutional framework that allows for better coordination because ultimately institutions are meant for uh, enhancing coordinated framework so i think those are the challenges going going forward that now that all like minded nations are more or less on the same page in terms of their vision in terms of their strategic uh, mapping what uh, kind of coordinated mechanisms we need to create to ensure that we do not lose the momentum that is being created and okay. of course there is you know there is a, also a lot of debate at, at rising on ukraine mm -hmm. and what ukraine crisis would uh, end up doing for the li larger uh, road map of for the indo pacific is going to be an important challenge and we should not be wishing it away uh, because that's a long term challenge from a european perspective and and we and we need to be cognizant of the challenge that it poses uh, for europe for india for the region and for the long term viability of the indo pacific okay indeed uh, that is uh, also one of the challenges there thank you so much uh, professor pant uh, stefania and uh, general katoch as well for sharing your views and insight as our experts were pointing out uh, all about the indo pacific region the construct itself and uh, of course india's vision for indo pacific uh, clearly pointing out that there has to be a rule based order free and open indo pacific all stakeholders uh, should get uh, equal opportunity and equal benefits as well and the larger countries the bigger nations will have to take on uh, larger responsibilities in this region we'll come back again tomorrow with a different topic till then keep watching sunset television thank you